From New York City, for our viewers worldwide, I'm Katie Greifeld. Bloomberg Real Yield starts right now. Coming up, the Fed delivers its final rate hike, even though the labor market is still red hot. All this regional banking stress continues to spread. We begin with the big issue, trying to take the edge off. We beat across the board. The unemployment rate is still at a multi-decade low. Job creation, wage growth, labor participation force, and also the unemployment rate. Tight labor market means really one thing. This is not getting back to the slowing that the bond market is expecting, that the Fed is hoping for. You're looking at a, at a potential downturn in the economy. An economy that's trying to avoid a recession. We can't rule out further policy rate hikes. What if the Fed really doesn't start cutting? As we go later into the year, the Fed will not cut. You will have real credit contraction, particularly in those areas that are affected by the small and regional banks. They will not cut if there is banking turmoil or financial market turmoil. This Fed is very hard to predict. They're playing with fire here. There is no roadmap for where we're at. Joining us now, I'm pleased to say, is Gargi Chowdhury of BlackRock and Brian Reeling of Wells Fargo. And Brian... Let's start to you, with you. Was that it? Have we reached terminal, or do you think that today's payrolls print changes the calculus a bit? Well, I thought even before the payroll number today that the likelihood of additional Fed rate hikes this year uh, was in the cards. I just don't think... Um, you know, the markets have it right uh, that we're going to kind of tip over here in the economy and see things slow where we're going to start getting uh, Fed rate cuts. Um, and if that doesn't happen and inflation stays above the Fed targets, which seems likely, I see no reason why they may pause in June, but in the future, they don't go back to hiking further. So maybe a stop and go sort of rate hiking cycle. We're definitely going to get to the cuts. But Gargi, come in on this. Do you think that we would have gotten a different Jerome Powell on Wednesday had we gotten the payrolls print before that press conference? Good afternoon, Katie. It is great to be here, and thank you for having me. And in terms of your question around would we have gotten a different Jerome Powell with one data print, no. I think that, you know, the Fed and the markets are very forward-looking, and they know that one month's data can be revised up or down, as we saw this month, with, previous, with the previous two months' prints getting revised lower. So I think the Fed signaled to us that the next, uh, for the next couple of months, they're going to be on a pause for perhaps even longer. However, the pause is not the same as a pivot. So while they have gotten rates higher for longer, that has been a theme that we've all been talking about, the higher part is here. So we've gotten to that five and an eighth. Now we stay, uh, we get to that longer part. So we stay here for a long time. They don't cut. But I don't think today's number makes a difference. And had they known it last week, I don't think it would have made a difference at all. Gargi, it's a fair point, two fair points that pause, different from a pivot, and of course, one data point doesn't really move the needle. We did hear from Ian Lingen of BMO Capital Markets earlier today. He says that today's job number will likely keep the Fed on hold for longer. He wrote, quote, that if nothing else, this will reinforce the Fed's bias to retain terminal for an extended period of time. We continue mm -hmm. to like fading near-term rate cut expectations, of course, as Powell emphasizes the effectiveness of macro prudential tools in containing the banking sector contagion. And Gargi, on that point, so perhaps it doesn't, you know, change us from a hike to a cut, et cetera, but what does this mean in terms of how long we could be on hold for? Sure. So uh, let's look at, look at a couple of things. So obviously, today's wage number shows that wage pressures still remain uh, in the economy. We're looking at about 4.45 percent. That is meaningful, certainly a lot higher than what the Fed would like to see. At the same time, what we see in the core PCE and core CPI data is that there is a moderation. So we have to acknowledge that there has been a moderation. But at the same time, we're significantly above the Fed's target of 2 percent on mm. core PCE. 
So what that means when you take that entirety of those two with unemployment rates being at the lowest since they were in May 1969, I think what that means is they can keep rates at current levels, five and an eighth, till the end of this year. Historically, over the last 40 or so years, all of the hiking cycles have averaged a, a, a pause of about 10 months. So could we see about that or maybe even a little bit shorter than that, perhaps? Uh, but at this juncture, there is nothing in the data to indicate that they are likely to cut from here, mm -hmm. especially when the job market holds in as well as it does and wages still continue to be pretty significantly higher than what they expect. And that's helpful context, too, that just looking at past hiking cycles, I mean, if we're on pause for 10 months on average, that gets us well into 2024. But, Brian, to the idea mm. that we could get another hike, that maybe we didn't see the final hike, what do you think it would take? Would we need to see inflation reaccelerate, or would it just simply be it not coming down quickly enough? Yeah, I think if it doesn't come down quick enough, if the job market stays strong, if, and the main thing, if nothing breaks, uh, you know, I think the markets, if you're expecting multiple Fed rate cuts this year still, as the markets are, you're basically expecting something to break, right? And it could. The time and place of something breaking, you know, that's kind of an unknown. Um, but if nothing breaks um, and those other factors kind of continue to chug along, yeah, I think that as we get into late summer, we may be talking about additional uh, Fed rate hikes still to, to get inflation down to their target levels. Well, more than a few people have said that maybe we've started to see things break a little bit, at least when it comes to the regional banks. And to that point, of course, we heard from Bill Dudley earlier saying uh, basically that there's one main culprit behind the banking term. We'll take a take a listen. My own personal view is it's going to be fairly weak because the problems that these banks face were not that they went out and made bad loans. The problem that, that these banks face is they went out and took a lot of interest rate risk. Of course, that was former uh, New York Fed president and current Bloomberg opinion columnist Bill Dudley. And Brian, on that point, basically how much of a tightening impulse is coming from what's happening in the regional banks? How are you trying to quantify that? What do you think that's worth? Well, it's difficult to quantify. Clearly, credit conditions are becoming uh, tighter. And while a lot of the problems that we're seeing are related to the long dated maturity uh, buying, you know, as credit conditions tighten, we may see those loans, we may see that credit start to roll over, start to break, right? So maybe we're not there yet. I mean, clearly you look at the spreads in the high yield market, they don't uh, flash stress or overly concerned levels, uh, but you know, we could get there. And so that could be the next shoe to drop, right? Eventually, uh, what is kind of was this kind of maturity, bad bet, you know, could roll into kind of a, a credit issue. We're not seeing that yet. But, you know, that is something that uh, could drive kind of this narrative where the Fed does have to start cutting rates. And a risk we haven't talked about yet somehow is the debt ceiling. And Gargi, I'm going to be honest, I don't like talking about the debt ceiling. It feels like we talk <laughs> about it every couple of years. It always works out kind of fine in the end. But here we are less than a month away from the so-called X date. Is this time going to be different? Yeah, you're right, Katie. I don't like talking about it either, but here we are talking about it again. Um, is this time going to be different? Listen, all we know is, you know, what we have so far, which is that President Biden is meeting, is going to have a very important meeting next week. I think there's going to be two important things or maybe three important things that the market's going to focus on next week. Obviously, CPI, which probably isn't even going to be the most important thing. I think SLUs are going to be more important than CPI for once. I never thought I'd heard my, uh, wow. hear myself say that. And then the, and then the Biden meeting. Um, I, hard to say if it's going to be different this time or or not. But what I will say is the nearer and nearer we get to that X date, I think you're going to continue to see investors moving towards quality. They're going to move towards fixed income. We've already seen that in fixed income ETF flows so far this year. There's a lot of buying of duration of TLT options, of buying of long end um, uh, duration, because investors want some, some sort of uh, flight to quality assets. And with negative correlations coming back in the fixed income market, I think uh, there might be reason to expect a little bit more volatility in the markets the closer we get to that date. But, you know, anyone's guess as to whether it comes down to the last, you know, the um, last hour mm -hmm. or if this is something that gets pushed out by three months. 
And Brian, we only have about 30 seconds left, but I got to get your take on that. What is more important next week? Is it CPI or is this the senior loan officer opinion survey, which is pronounced SLUS? <laughs> I think I'll still go with CPI. I, I do think the inflation okay. story is, uh, is important for the Fed. Yep. All right, guys, great place to leave it. Really appreciate both of you taking the time. That is Gargi Chowdhury of BlackRock and Brian Reeling of Wells Fargo. Thank you both. Up next, it's the auction block where we go into the metaverse to find a surge in high grade bond sales. That's next. This is Real Yield on Bloomberg. I'm Katie Greifeld, this is Bloomberg Real Yield. Time now for the auction block where companies had numerous factors to navigate when considering offerings this week. In Europe, there's a renewed sense of caution with weekly sales falling. This comes at the same time that a measure of credit risk for European IG rose to the highest level in a month. Over here in the US though, Meta led a surge of bond sales earlier in the week. It raised $8.5 billion in a five part deal, helping to drive the weekly total near $30 billion. And in high yield, Vistajet and others helped to fuel a $5 billion week, making it the busiest since early April. The month total has already surpassed May's total for last year. And as the regional bank turmoil continues, Winnie Caesar of Credit Size says that there's a few different red flags that she's watching. In order for things to get really concerning, we need to see capital stop flowing to the parts of the market where it should flow. Investment grade bond market close, right? That's usually consistent with big freezes. And we saw that on the heels of Silicon Valley Bank for you know a full five or six days where the bond market issued zero bonds, which was a little bit unnerving. But we thought that was much more related to issuers saying, whoa, 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 we're going to sit on the sidelines. We don't need to step into this mess. We can wait it out and see. And a lot of that is because they were so proactive last year, even amid all the market volatility, and issuing an awful lot of bonds. And we think that that kind of two way flow is still pretty indicative of credit conditions while they've tightened. They're not necessarily super rolling over at this point. Joining us now, Matt Brill of Invesco and Will Smith of Alliance Bernstein. And guys, this is fun because, Will, you focus on high yield. Matt, you're an investment grade guy. Let's start with Will. I want to talk about the movement that we're finally starting to see when it comes to spreads. We're back to 150 basis points on investment grade. We're closing in on 500 basis points in high yield specifically. Do you think that there's more to go when it comes to this widening? Hi, Katie. Nice to be here. Um, we do think that there are risks that spreads could continue to widen. Um, we are in this period now, we call it a transition period of moving from inflation concerns to recession concerns. And there's a chance that banking volatility or some other aspect of the economy slowing causes spreads to go wider. But overall, we view spreads as relatively attractive at these levels. Mm. And all in yields at high yield and um, north of eight and a half percent still get a lot of interest from investors. Um, so we think things are, are somewhat balanced here, though the risks to spreads are probably to the upside. So it sounds like you're saying that perhaps entry points are being created here. Yeah, I think that's fair. If you're a longer term investor, um, it, it's actually been pretty rare over the last even decade to buy high yield yields at these types of levels and investment grade for that matter. I mean, all in yields are, are attractive. Um, now, spreads could be volatile. We think they will be volatile as we deal with a lot of macro uncertainty and issues like the, the banks that we've seen. Um, but for long term investors, we think this is a good entry point. Matt, is that the view in the blue chip bond market as well? We're finally starting to see a little bit of a sell off. Do you think that there's more to go here or would you be buying the dip? Hey, Katie. Um, I think that in the investment grade market, the, the technicals are going to remain strong. So it's been a little bit of a, of a very chaotic week. Um, but overall, the trend continues to be for inflows. And, and we think that the higher quality spectrum within IG is, is going to uh, hold in well and, and actually should be able to tighten from here. So, so I'd be a buyer um, in this, in this sell-off now. You know, there, there's, there's two parts of the market. There's the financials or the banks, and then there's the non-financials. And, and right now, you know, the, the financials are very tough. So when I'm talking about getting inflows of what we're buying with the next dollar, you know, that's going into things that are not bank-related currently. 
Well, I'm happy you brought that up because out at Milken this week, we heard from TCW CEO Katie Koch saying that there may be more risk than reward when it comes to betting on the regional banks. Let's take a listen. If you look at companies with 100 employees or less, 70 percent of their commercial industrial financing is dependent on banks with less than 250 billion in deposits. And 30 percent is dependent on banks with less than 10 billion in deposits. So as we get this deposit flight, we're going to have a credit crunch and that's going to put downward pressure on jobs. We would be very underweight, the regional banks. So, Matt, it sounds like you broadly agree with that point, and not just regional banks. It sounds like you're cautious on the sector overall. Well, well we think there's, there's potentially a lot of value in the regional banks, uh, but it's, it's almost become unanalyzable um, mm. and, and uninvestable. And so, you know, because it's unanalyzable, a lot of the traditional framework that you would look at banks really is not relevant right now. They just had pretty good earnings, actually. And um, she spoke of deposit flight, but most of the regionals actually really didn't have much deposit flight. They had to pay up for CDs and things like that to keep the deposits in, in house. But they actually had a pretty good quarter, and then they turn around and they're just getting absolutely obliterated since. So it's not that the the fundamentals matters, the, the liquidity matters, and also it's just a complete crisis of confidence. So you need to get a, an injection of confidence back into the regional banks in order for that sector to do well. If you get that, you're going to do extremely well in the regional banks, but it's just a gamble that most investment grade buyers are not used to having to do. I really like that point, that it's almost unanalyzable, these regional banks. Will, bring this into your world of high yield debt. Are you seeing that crisis of confidence spill over in any parts of the market? Not really, Katie. I mean, if you look at issuance and what investors have been willing to buy this year, there's still a very big quality bias to it. Investors are still concerned that um, there's a recession on the horizon. And, and I think the banking crisis only really solidifies that view because you think that credit conditions will continue to tighten on a go forward basis, which just makes refinancing short term debt a lot harder when you enter this period and with, with a weak balance sheet or weak business prospects. Um, so we continue to see a lot more demand for quality rather than say something like a triple C bond, which um, those spreads remain very, very wide versus the rest of the market. And we think for good reason. And so if you had to talk about, you know, the sort of emblematic triple C company, what sector, what does that name typically look like? What industries are your investors, your clients avoiding right now? Well, there, there's some that are pretty obvious things that are related to US residential home construction. Um, so building products, building materials. Um, those businesses did really well during COVID and, and they made a lot of money. Um, we saw some sponsor activity around that and there was a lot of leverage put on that space. And those businesses are really going to struggle to get back to those levels of earnings. And without being able to grow earnings enough, those balance sheets just look incredibly stretched. So that would be the, probably the most emblematic this cycle. And I want to go global a little bit here because there was a really interesting quote in a Bloomberg News article earlier this week from Guy Steer of SockGen. He has low expectations for the U.S. credit market compared to Europe, saying, quote, in six to nine months, I expect Europe to trade tighter than the U.S. Things will get worse faster in the U.S. credit market than in the European credit market. Matt, walk us through that. Is that your view as well when you're taking that global lens? Yeah, and while we have um, pockets of construction or a, a constructive view on pockets of the, the U.S. market, you know we're, we're much broaderly constructive on, uh, on on Europe. So you know there's there's plenty of problems in the U.S. that, that are not existing in, in, in Europe. So there's no debt ceiling issue. Um, there's no regional bank issues. The Credit Suisse situation was really the weakest bank that's now been you know pushed into UBS. So that's sort of maybe not off the table, but certainly minimized. And then last, the energy situation, the energy crisis that was going on there post-Russia invasion of Ukraine, you know, appears to be under control. So you get wider credit spreads and you don't have three major issues, two of those that are huge issues in the U.S. Um, the one issue that I think you do possibly have, though, in Europe is that the ECB is still hiking mm. versus we think the Fed is now at the end of the road. Yeah, that's a fair point. We're starting to see these central banks really move out of lockstep. And Matt, we only have about 30 seconds left. But again, when you look at the IG market in the U.S., where's the most opportunity at this point? So if you want to get the year right, you're going to have to get the banks right. Mm -hmm. And right now, the regionals are, are too tough to play. I think you can go to the big six. 
Try to get your timing right there. If you're wrong, you're wrong because you're early. You're not wrong because they're going to default. Um, Bank of America was just upgraded this week um, by, by Moody's, believe it or not. So it was upgraded this week. So to me, that's the way to play this when you get the turn, which the turn is going to be very, very hard to find. But that's how you got to make money in, in, in the U.S. this year if you're going to own it. If you think it's going wider, you just got to get out of everything, basically. Will, I'm going to let you have the last word. Same question. When you look at the junk bond market, where's the best opportunity right now? We think the, the cable, tech, satellite, and healthcare areas are probably the most interesting to look at. Um, that's generally the playbook that you use during a recession. Those are the industries that have less cyclical sensitivity. And if you're concerned about a recession, they tend to be the businesses that hold up better. This cycle is unique because those bonds are already trading very wide. They have other issues going on. Um, so if you're able to pick your spots well there, we think that's the chance to, to make the most money this year. All right, guys, really great discussion. Really appreciate both of your time. That is Matt Brill of Invesco and Will Smith of Alliance Bernstein. Have a great weekend. Still ahead on this program, though, it's the final spread. The week ahead, big data point to keep an eye on, of course, is the April CPI print. That's coming up next. This is Real Yield on Bloomberg. I'm Katie Greifeld. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. Time now for the final spread. The week ahead coming up, it's the Fed's senior loan officer opinion survey out on Monday. The SLUs, if you will. And then on Tuesday, we have President Biden's meeting with congressional leaders about the debt ceiling. And then midweek, it's the big one. We're going to get U.S. CPI before PPI on Thursday, plus a Bank of England rate decision. You miss sentiment follows, and then UK GDP rounds out the week on Friday. But CPI, of course, will be the one to watch. I know that Gargi Chowdhury disagrees with me, but let's go through some of the numbers here. Year over year, we're expecting CPI to come in at 5%, the same as we got from the prior month. So the pace of disinfl disinflation rather, is decelerating. And of course, we're going to see a little bit of a disconnect between headline and core. But from from New York, that does it from for us. Same time, same place next week. This was Bloomberg Real Yield, and this is Bloomberg.